I now call to order the Society's 2,387th meeting in the 147th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Aviv Vergev in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW's YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements and a reading of the minutes of the 2,386th meeting and Margaret Linen's lecture on taking the pulse of the oceans. I will present a short summary of the proceedings of the 39th meeting of the Society that took place in 1873. And then we will turn to this evening's lecture, which will be followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and then adjourn the meeting to the social hour. So please join me in thanking the sponsors of the fall 2017 and spring 2018 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a generous sponsor who was asked to remain anonymous. In addition, please join me in thanking the sponsor of tonight's particular lecture, PSW member Timothy Thomas. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to the society. Rosalind Carney, a neuroscientist with a PhD from Oxford and a freelance science writer interested in molecular and cellular biology and neurosciences who comes to PSW through a social media site called Indeed.com that I have to say we'd never heard of until she applied for membership. And tonight's speaker, Aviv Regev, whose interests will be apparent from tonight's lecture. So please join me in welcoming them to the society. <laughs> if any of our recently announced new members are here tonight, and they did not pick up uh, your copy of the volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, yeah. signed by me, please uh, come to the lectern after the lecture and the question and answer period, and I will be happy to provide you with a copy. In the absence of James Heelan, our recording secretary, corresponding secretary Robin Taylor will now read the minutes of Margaret Linen's PSW President's Lecture at the 2386 meeting earlier this month. Robin, you have the podium. President Larry Milstein called the 2,386th meeting of the Society to Order on January 5th, 2018 at 8.07 p.m. in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. He announced that this was the annual President's Lecture. He then announced the order of business, noted that the meeting was being live streamed on the Internet, and welcomed new members to the Society. Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor read excerpts from the anniversary address of the first president of the society, Joseph Henry. The address, given in the year of the society's founding on November 18, 1871, is published in Volume 1 of the PSW Bulletin. In the address, Henry stated the purposes of the society, and discussed the challenges to doing good science and communicating it to the public. He warned the society not to be under the influence of amateurs and politicians. <laughs> President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Margaret Linen, 
Director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and Vice Chancellor for Marine Science at the University of California, San Diego. Her lecture was entitled, Taking the Pulse of the Ocean in a Changing World. She began her talk by noting that recent technological advances and the capture and analysis of large data sets have transformed the field of ocean science and our understanding of the ocean. She noted that the measurement of ocean temperatures and fluctuations in them of great concern recently are one area that has benefited from these advances. Historically, scientists relied upon ships traversing the ocean to make occasional measurements to chart ocean temperatures. The ships were only able to provide several hundred samples per year. But starting in the year 2000, scientists have been able to deploy autonomous floats that collect better data and transmit every five days. There are now over 4,000 such floats operating around the globe. This technological advancement has allowed scientists to comprehensively identify both warming and cooling patterns in the oceans and to measure ice melt and ocean salinity. With respect to sea level, from the 1880s until around 1990, scientists principally relied upon tide gauge measurements to track sea level. Then in the 1990s, Satellite altimetry provided scientists with dense enough data for scientists to map sea levels and identify their uneven distribution around the globe. The data generated from this technology allows scientists to better predict the specific effects of sea level rise on different parts of the world. Technology which allows for consistent sampling has also revealed dynamic ocean changes. For example, sampling for surface ocean acidity, which is linked to increased CO2 levels in the water, shows that the oceans are 30% more acidic than they were in 1850. In the mid-2000s, scientists began to understand the impact of ocean acidification on the ocean's biota. Research on pteropods, which are ocean snails, shows that they have become less able to make pristine shells. Scientists believe this is due to ocean acidification, which decreases the availability of carbonate ions. In addition to increasing acidification, the increase of carbon in the ocean, along with rising ocean temperatures, has led to an increase in biota growth and consumption of oxygen. This has resulted in ocean deoxygenation, which has caused some ocean life, such as fish, to be displaced. Further effects are still being studied. Technological advances have also led to an increase in the quality and quantity of deep sea field research. This is important because laboratory work cannot account for all of the factors necessary to fully understand ocean life and to answer questions about how that life will cope with ocean change. In sum, Dr. Leinen said, large data sets allow scientists to explore new ways of doing ocean science. Much of 20th century scientific thinking was deductive hypothesis testing, using a sampling strategy designed to answer those specific questions. This methodology often precluded other insights. In contrast, the availability of larger and denser data sets has allowed scientists to identify trends and reach conclusions largely by induction. Dr. Leinen said she encourages scientists and funders of science to continue adding to existing data sets and to conduct more science in the field. President Milstein then invited questions from the audience. One member asked how ocean deoxygenation affects zooplankton migration. 
Dr. Leinen said that during the night, zooplankton reside on the ocean surface and migrate down into the ocean during the day. She said, there is data suggesti suggesting zooplankton are not migrating as deeply into some deoxygenated zones. A live stream viewer asked whether scientists have considered the effects of carbon in deep ocean water that is now mixing with surface waters. Dr. Leinen said that scientists have considered the matter, but lack the data to reach any conclusions at this time. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 10.05 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,386 meeting of the society to the social hour. Weather, clear. Temperature, minus 9.5 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Attendance, 103. Respectfully submitted, and on his behalf, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Robin. Are there any comments, additions, or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion from a member to accept the minutes as read. Eric. Do I have a second from a member? Anne. All members in favor say aye. Aye. All members opposed say nay. The minutes are unanimously accepted as read and will be posted to the website in due course. The 39th meeting of the society was held on 18 January 1873, almost exactly 145 years ago. President Joseph Henry was in the chair, presiding. As many of you know by now, Joseph Henry was a primary founder of PSW and its longest serving president leading the organization from 1871 until his death in 1878. He was a preeminent American physicist of his time, known internationally for his pioneering work on electricity and magnetism, particularly his work on electromagnetic induction work that led to the invention of the telegraph and the telephone in which he participated. Among other important roles, Henry also served as founding and first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Wikipedia, that fount of wisdom, provides the following interesting vignette, which seems to be accurate as far as my research can tell, involving Henry and Alexander Graham Bell, who also was later a prominent PSW member. As a famous scientist and director of the Smithsonian Institution, Henry received visits from other scientists and inventors who sought his advice. One such visitor was Alexander Graham Bell, who on 1 March 1875 carried a letter of introduction to Henry. Henry showed an interest in seeing Bell's experimental apparatus, and Bell returned the following day. After the demonstration, Bell mentioned his untested theory on how to transmit human speech electronically by means of a harp apparatus, which would have several steel rods tuned to different frequencies to cover the voice spectrum. Henry said Bell had, quote, the germ of a great invention, close quote. Henry advised Bell not to publish his idea until he had perfected the invention. When Bell objected that he lacked the necessary knowledge, Henry said, get it. On 13 January 1877, almost two years later, Bell demonstrated his instruments to Henry at the Smithsonian Institution, and Henry then invited Bell to demonstrate them again that night at the Washington Philosophical Society, which is now known as PSW. As a leading scientific institution of the day, PSW was one of the first places Bell demonstrated a working telephone apparatus. Bell became a prominent PSW member and later, famously or infamously, engaged in heated debates with Gallaudet on the best ways of treating hearing impairments. Uh, more on that in the recounting of later PSW meetings. Henry died on 13 May 1878 and was buried in Oak Hill Cemetery in the Georgetown section 
of Northwest Washington, D.C. John Philip Sousa wrote the Transit of Venus March for the unveiling of the Henry statue in front of the Smithsonian Institution. At that meeting, the 39th, Mr. R.D. Cutts reported on astronomical observations made at Sherman Station in what was then Wyoming Territory. Sherman, Sherman Station was at the summit of the original grade of the first transcontinental railroad. And being high and having railroad service made it a very promising location for astronomy. The station and surrounding geographical features are named for founding PSW, William Tecumseh Sherman of Civil War fame. Uh, the bulletin, however, does not describe the contents of the presentation. At that meeting, Mr. R. Keith read a paper on achromatic object glasses. Optics and optical manufacturing techniques were of intense interest then, and now for that matter, and improvements in microscopes were leading to advances in biology and medicine in particular. As many of you know, different wavelengths of light are bent differently as they pass from the atmosphere into and then out of a glass lens. As a result, different colors focus at different points on the far side of a lens, causing distortion and limiting acuity. It is possible using the right combination of glasses and lens shapes to greatly reduce this source of distortion, allowing greater magnification with greater clarity. Although the bulletin does not say, we imagine that the subject of the discussion was lens design to reduce such chromatic distortion. Mr. G.A. Otis made a presentation on fractures of the cranium. And what he had to say about broken heads, I don't know. Those pictured in here are intact. Lastly, Mr. T. Gill, a frequent speaker in those days, presented some observations on homologies in the arms of fishes, and more specifically on the development of the humerus in ganoids. Ganoids are an older order of fish that includes bichir, sturgeon, and freshwater garfish. They are characterized in particular by hard and bony scales with a shiny enamel-like surface. Gill was an ichthyologist, mammologist, and malacologist. He was a professor of zoology at George Washington University, served as Smithsonian librarian and assistant librarian at the Library of Congress. He was elected president of the AAAS in 1897. He was an author on a remarkable number of publications in his career, over 400. Unaccountably, he never served as a PSW president, however. And with that, we will continue the tradition of PSW and turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Aviv Rugev. Aviv is a professor of biology at MIT, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and chair of the faculty and director of the Klarman Cell Observatory and Cell Circuits Program at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. She's also co-chair of the organizing committee for the International Human Cell Atlas Project. Aviv is a computational and systems biologist. She studies the molecular circuitry that governs the function of mammalian cells in health and disease. She pioneered many leading experimental and computational methods for the reconstruction of cell circuits, including single cell genomics. She is a recipient of an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, a Sloan Fellowship, the Overton Prize from the ISCB, the International Society for Computational Biology, the Statman Scholar Award from the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and the ISCB Innovator Award. She was also an ISCB Fellow. Aviv earned a Master's of Science and a PhD in Computational Biology from Tel Aviv University. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture, and join me in welcoming Aviv to the speaker, to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. For, thank you for the remarkable opportunity to speak here. And um, I actually feel that there is something similar between what I'm going to talk about today and at some abstracted level, the PSW, because first of all, the timelines are going to be rather synced. Looking and trying to catalog very systematically human cells is kind of a 150-plus year endeavor, and that 
is similar to the timeline of the PSW. And also, in that sense, it's something that in one sense is very old and in another sense is very new and current. And, and, and I, had a, I had a wonderful time, actually, today um, um, in this very gem-like uh, environment. And so I'm going to talk about cells today. Cells are the basic unit of life. You can't actually reduce below cells. It's not genes, it's not DNA, it's cells. Only cells beget cells. And um, cells, or human cells in particular, come in many different shapes and sizes and perform many different functions. And people have been busy classifying them for quite a while, and they do it in many different ways. Based on the way that they look, their morphology or their structures, the location that they have in the body, the function that they think that they assume, and the molecules that, have, that they have um, inside them. This idea is not new in any way. But what I want to talk to you about today is how to think about this in the context of pe periodic tables. And so periodic tables have been very useful in science, one in particular, the periodic table of the elements. What was very compelling about the periodic table of the elements is not just the fact that it was comprehensive and it actually had all of them, but the fact that there were actually holes in it, but we knew something would have to fill them in. There was an underlying set of principles behind them. Another, in a sense, project that has attempted to achieve another set of elements was a set of elements for genetics in biology and especially for human genetics, which was the Human Genome Project. And the elements there were genes. And it is a question on whether from that you could derive a general principle of what a gene is, but absent that, you definitely couldn't. And the one that we aspire to maybe be able to fill in um, in the next decade or so, or so would be a periodic table of the cells of humans. And so, as I said, this is actually not a new thing. This is something that um, people have endeavored to do for at least 150 years, 150 plus. It actually started well before then with the discovery of the, of the cells in the 1600s by Hooke. And it has always been an endeavor that was driven, driven by technological advances, the first one being the microscopes. But then came the stains. This is a Golgi stain, for example, that allowed us to character, allowed uh, Cajal to characterize neurons. And then additional types of stains for specific molecules, for proteins, technologies to sort cells based on the molecules that they express, like the fluorescent activated cell sorter, the, and different ways of looking at them under a fluorescent microscope that gave us much more remarkable resolution. And every time a new technology came up, biologists turned around and tried to understand cells better, to classify them in a more refined way and figure out better who they are and what they do. There's a problem, though. Despite this ongoing endeavor, this is a pretty big search space. And the reason is that there are roughly 37 trillion cells in the body. It's actually an interesting question in its own right. How do you actually determine how many there are? Because it's a pretty big entity and the cells are pretty small. Um, but if you open Wikipedia or a textbook, it will talk about maybe 300 major cell types. This is not wrong at some level, but it is ridiculous at another. Because if you turn around to an immunologist, they will start chuckling because they know of well-identifiable more than 300 types and subtypes of immune cells, where they know their molecules and what they do and where they come from and so on. And that's just the immune system. If you talk to a retina biologist, they will also chuckle because they know of at least 100 sub and sub subtypes of neurons in the retina alone. So, at some sense, these 300 are an appropriate number because they describe some big categories, and at another sense, they are a ridiculously low number, and no one actually knows how many there are. And that's an interesting thing to behold because, again, that is very similar to the situation that biologists had with the number of genes in the human genome. Actually, before the Human Genome Project, there were a lot of bits, and few of them were as low as the number that actually came out in the end. But what is also remarkable, even that number, even more than a decade after the human genome has been finished, is not actually a definitive number. People still find them cropping up, and our definition of what a gene is changes as a result. And that actually relates also to the talk that I guess was here the previous time, the oceanography talk. The ability to look at data often changes your preconception of the thing that you're actually looking at. And so we know there are a lot and we don't know how many, and we would like to systematically identify all of them. You know, um, what might we find? So we already know that there are going to be many different aspects to what identifies a cell. At the first level is what we call a type. This is, for example, a picture, a photo, a microscopy image of a neuron. 
That is a type of a cell. This, on the other hand, is an immune dendritic cell. And I chose it because it also has these long dendrites, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the nervous system. It is actually an immune cell, and it comes from the hematopoietic system. This dendrite it uses to migrate, actually, throughout our body. So these are two different types of cells, and most biologists would agree they're different and they're types. But then this immune cell, this dendritic cell, is a very specialized cell, and it recognizes pathogen components different molecules, actually, that characterize different types of bacteria or viruses or fungi. And when it recognizes one of those, it actually becomes this. This is an activated dendritic cell, which is mature, and it looks quite different than this one. But all biologists would agree that they're both dendritic cells of the same type, and that what has happened is that the state of this cell has changed. And the same would happen to a cell when it ate something right now, or when the sun is up or the sun is down, together with the circadian rhythm. So these are state changes. Obviously, in order to get from here to here, or from a fertilized egg all the way to a neuron, a whole series of transitions has to happen. And so these transitions are dynamic and they're transient by nature. But as the cells go through them, they kind of look and behave differently. So that is also part of their identity. I already mentioned that the cells have a very specific history. Every cell in the body had to have come from a series of cell divisions, starting with a single cell, the fertilized egg. And so this set of lineage relations is also part of the identity of the cell, part of its calling card. And then the cells are located in particular places, both at the level of gross anatomy and then at the very fine level of histology, of the organization of the tissue. And they even have immediate neighbors. And those immediate neighbors, those neighborhoods in which they result, the other friends that they're talking to right now, also impact them and affect their identity. So there are many aspects as to the identity of the cell. And any given cell that we would pick belongs to a certain type, is in a particular state, might be in the middle of some dynamic transition. In, 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 in fact, all of them will be in the middle of some dynamic set of events, not just one, but multiples. It has a particular lineage that traces it back to the fertilized egg. It's located somewhere in the body and it's talking to someone. And many of these things could be shared in all sorts of cross-cutting ways. You could have two cells of different types being in the same state because they're both, for example, in the same phase of their cell cycle as they divide. So we know all of these things will exist because of decades and decades of research in biology. Our problem is that we don't know them in a comprehensive sense. How come do we have, the, how, come is it, how is it that we have so many different cells but only one genome? So all of these cells in the body actually carry to a first level of approximation the same genome. There are differences, there are mutations that accrue as we age, and so there are some slight differences. There are, in certain parts of our body, like the immune system, changes that are much more substantial in particular places, but by and large we can say the same genome. And yet, many different cells. So again, probably well known to people here, but just to make sure everyone is on the same page, there is a set of regulated steps that leads from the DNA that carries the same set of instructions to the molecules that the cell actually carries in it, and in particular those highly informative molecules called RNA molecules that then carry the instructions for proteins which are by and large the business end of the cell. The process that leads from DNA to RNA is called transcription. From RNA to protein, the process is called translation. I am not going to belabor the molecular biology details that, again, have been one of the greatest successes of molecular biology of the last several decades to figure out how these processes are done. But what is important to know is that these processes are highly regulated, meaning the cell chooses which parts of its DNA, which of its genes will actually get transcribed to RNA and at which level. How many copies of RNA out of the two copies of the gene that exist in our genome? And then it chooses which of these RNAs will actually end up getting translated to protein and at which level and how stable those proteins would be so that we end up with a quantitative difference between the cells and a qualitative difference between the cells. It's which kinds of molecules are there, that's the qualitative difference, and then how much of each of them, which is a quantitative difference. And that becomes a good, you know, calling card of the identity of the cell. Now, this matters a great deal for many purposes, all the way from very basic research to very applied and medical uh, purposes. 
Why so? Because think of the case that we have a genetic variant that might either um, cause disease directly or increase our risk of developing a certain disease. All the cells in the body carry the same genetic variant, but only some of the cells in the body actually use the gene in which that genetic variant exists. And so if the genetic variant is, for example, in a gene that is very important to neural function or to skeletal muscle function or to the function of astrocytes, which are support cells for the brain, or fibroblasts, which are in our connective tissue, or fat cells like adipocytes, or dendritic cells, those cells I showed you from the immune system, depending on that, we would see a completely different manifestation in terms of disease. So, for example, if the gene is critical for the function of dendritic cells, you might end up with an autoimmune disease like Crohn's disease, whereas if it is a critical gene for the function of skeletal muscle, you might end up with muscular dystrophy. There is a mutation in this gene also in dendritic cells, but dendritic cells don't use the gene products. They don't transcribe RNA from it, and they don't translate protein out of that RNA. And so even though there is a mutation there, the dendritic cell couldn't care less. That's, again, a crude description, but not entirely wrong, and actually quite useful for us. And so, as I told you, the level of expression of these molecules characterizes the cell. And we like to call the overall description across all of the RNA species, all of the kinds of RNAs that the cell could express, I am going to call that an expression profile. And for those who are mathematically inclined, you can think about it as a vector. And if we have 20,000 genes in our genome, then this vector has 20,000 elements in it. And the values there can be any number, basically, or bounded by the number of molecules that can exist in a cell. So every cell can now be characterized by this profile. And so this is nice, because all of a sudden, this gives us a unified set of coordinates. In this unified set of coordinates, every gene is basically an axis. And every cell now becomes a point in a very high dimensional space. I can't draw 20,000 dimensions. I can draw actually on a two-dimensional plot. We can make the optical illusion of three dimensions, and that's where it stops. But imagine that this is a 20,000 dimensional space. And every point in this space describes specifically a certain level of expression for every gene. So the position of a cell in this space is basically its expression profile. And if two cells express very similar genes, they are going to be very close to each other in this very high dimensional space. And moreover, there might be places in this big space that we're imagining that are very dense. And maybe we see a lot of cells there, maybe even of the same kind, or maybe multiple cells of different kinds, but they're all kind of similar with respect to those dimensions. So we could imagine that in addition to the original dimensions of the 20,000 genes, we could abstract away from these a whole other set of coordinates that maybe describes things like identities and transitions and states and all of these other wonderful things that we know should exist. This is all wonderful. There's only one little hitch. We can measure the level of expression of every RNA in the cell. We can't actually measure the level of expression of every protein, but pretty close, okay? Using a whole set of techniques that were developed over many, many years. But until very recently, all we could measure was averages. We couldn't actually measure it for every cell individually. We could only measure it for maybe 10 million of them at a time. We would take all of them together, mush them all up, take the RNA content and measure it. Or we would take a whole piece of tissue, which would be made of hundreds of millions of cells, mush all of that up and measure the average of that. And that, by the way, is the average Israeli woman. So it's actually not entirely different than me. I happen to be Israeli. But it's also not exactly like me. And it definitely does not distinguish between me and many other Israeli women who look sort of similar but also very different from each other. So averages are not great for us. And so this is where the technological advances come in. And this is actually not made specifically for this audience. This is the favorite um, metaphor of my specific field, which is single cell genomics, that the old techniques that required a lot of cells can be thought of as the fruit smoothie. 
you have many different fruits brought in, you mush all of them up, and you get something on average. And you can say that it's fruity, and you can say that this one might have had a lot of kiwis, this had a lot of strawberries, and this had a lot of bananas. But the truth is that amongst the bananas there were some blueberries and also some strawberries, except that they were a minority and we can't see them at all. And also that this banana and that banana were not exactly the same. On the other hand, this is a fruit salad. And I can get a, an exact enumeration both of the different kinds of fruits that are there and also of their quantities. And by this, I can say things a lot more specific about the composition of this entity that I was looking at than with the fruit smoothie. That's the idea behind single cell genomics. Take a piece of tissue, dissociate it into individual cells, capture each of these cells individually. A lot of the cleverness lies in how you do this. Get the RNA just of that one cell, convert this RNA into another molecule called DNA. We call this cDNA, and that matters because with DNA, we know how to work really easily. And in particular with DNA, we know how to sequence it really well. And this started, the first papers around this started several years ago, and at first people did a handful of cells. They did one or two. They did 10. Our first experiment was 18 of them, and they were those immune dendritic cells that I showed you before. And at some point, the technology got better and better, actually, especially around how you capture the cells, and you do all of them in parallel in massive quantities. And this is just our own data, and there are many other labs in the world who work on this, and it moved all of a sudden to this very nice regime when you could do millions and millions and millions of them. And it doesn't take you a lot of effort, and it even doesn't take you that much money. So that opens up completely new possibilities because the data becomes big. That's one technological advance. And we're going to spend most of our time with it, but I want to be very precise that you're still losing information. So biology looks like this. It's beautifully structured. It's actually a fruit tart. It's not a fruit salad. It's not everything mixed together, or we would look kind of messy. So it is a fruit tart, and we especially like the fruit tart description because the way biologists often look at tissue is that they slice it. So you're kind of looking from the top rather than you can see the whole mount, which would be everything together. But ideally, it would actually be 3D, and I'll have to come up with a non-fruity metaphor at that point. But this still survives. And so a whole other set of techniques that are more emerging than single-cell genomics, but this field moves super fast year on year. And so another... I, an entire additional set of techniques allows us to measure things in situ, in the tissue, as it is structured. So we don't only know that these are the genes that are expressed in this cell, but we know that these are genes expressed in this cell when it's located here and looks like that. And its neighbor is this one, and it looks in another way. These techniques, bear this in mind because it's going to a little bit matter later, tend not to work yet at genome scale. They work on what we call signatures, on subsets of genes, on maybe 10 of them, or 20 of them, or 140 of them. That's not a number invented. One of the methods, that their magic number. They do 140. And sometimes you measure it with RNAs, and sometimes you measure actually proteins. So they're more limited in their scope, but it's much more than one. And that's going to matter, so just bear that in mind. So now, all of a sudden, we have lots of tools in our hands. We have ambition, we have this feeling that this surely should tell us something useful about all of these things, the types and the states and the locations and the changes. And what I'm actually going to try um, and do today is try to convince you that you can actually learn all of those things. And that from those things we can learn both fundamental, sorry, can learn both fundamental biology and do something also quite useful for human, li human lives. And getting both of those together at the same time is always a very happy moment for a scientist, especially a scientist that studies biology, and that this is feasible and doable and happening right now, and also tell you a little bit at the end about an initiative, an international initiative, completely grassroots, started by scientists across the world to try and come together and really build in a completely open way what we call the Human Cell Atlas, which would be a comprehensive reference map of the types and the properties of human cells, which are the fundamental unit of life, as a, as a research project, but that can serve as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating both disease, but also understanding health a lot better. And so the vast majority of my talk is going to be a series of vignettes about 
why build a human cell atlas, or rather, what would we learn if we actually did it? And rather than talking hypotheticals, I will show you a series of things that have already been learned by the proto-atlas, by the distributed work of people in multiple labs working on these kinds of problems with these kinds of techniques. And I'm going to try and argue that we're going to learn something about four major aspects of basic biology in the human. The first is the taxonomy of cell types. The second is histology, or how tissue is structured. The third is developmental biology, the fates of cells and those lineages. And then physiology, all these transient processes that lead to diverse states and also how these states can be maintained over a period of time and then plastically changed. And then in each of these contexts, I'm going to try to sow the seed that this has real opportunity to impact health and medicine, that is going to help us understand which genetic variants are going to act in which cell, which is really important for then following up on them and trying to understand disease mechanisms, that's going to help us make better cells or organoids, that maybe we can understand disease mechanisms better, that we would give some nice tools to people who do drug discovery, that when we have a drug, we might be able to avoid certain toxicities and maybe even understand better drug efficacy and resistance, and finally, maybe have some nice diagnostic tools. The bulk of my talk is not about those things, but I'm going to give you a flavor of where they might come from. So I'm going to start with taxonomy. The goal here is to discover cell types that we did not know exist, but also to better characterize the ones that we already kind of know exist in our body. And the idea is very simple. We will take these expression profiles, these RNA molecules that we have in each individual cell, We'll take a tissue that has a lot of different cells. We'll grab each of them individually. We will look at the RNA that they have in them, and we will try to group like and like together. So if cell one and cell two are very similar in the molecules that they have, and I put them as little points in this super high dimensional, 20,000 dimensional space, they should fall close together. And if they're falling close together, I would say, ah, Maybe there are two of the same. And if I see a lot of those the same, they should appear as sort of a little bit of a cloud. They're not falling in exactly the same point because A, biology is not that precise, and B, our measurement is not that precise. But it's close enough to each other, and it's kind of far away from all the other guys. And then I'll say, ah, they might be a type. That's the general concept. And what is remarkable about it is how well it actually works. So remember those cells in the retina? The retina is actually composed of five major subsets of cells. One of those, the retinal neurons are composed of five major subsets of cells. One of those subsets are called bipolar neuro, uh, neurons. This is because they have one pole going up and one pole going down. And this is, these are um, about 27,000 of them. There are so many of them on this plot that you actually can tell the dots one from the other. Now, I was talking about 20,000 dimensional space but I also only have a two-dimensional slide, true? And so there's a beautiful approach um, that was not developed for this purpose at all. It was developed in 1995 called T-stochastic neighborhood embedding. And this is a probabilistic and non-linear approach to take something that's in very high dimensions and reduce it to two. With a probabilistic guarantee that if two things were close to each other in the high dimensional space, they will with very high probability remain close to each other in the two-dimensional reduction so I can actually look at it with my eyes. Okay? Point taken? Now, I'm not guaranteed actually anything else, but I am guaranteed that. The other thing that you might notice is that they're colored with colorful colors. These were not made by a human. These were made by an algorithm. And what the algorithm does is that it actually doesn't use this picture at all. The picture is only shown at the end post hoc to the scientists to look at the beautiful data that they generated, the algorithm put, starts with a graph of the cells. Two cells that are close, based on their distance in high dimensional space, get an edge between them. And every cell is connected to the K nearest neighbors, the K cells that are the closest to it. And you decide K. K is a parameter. Now the algorithm takes this graph and tries to find communities of cells in it. And this algorithm was not, again, developed at all for cells and again, is more than 10 years old. It was defined in order to find communities, for example, in the web. So it scales really well with large numbers. And that gives us the colors. All the cells that are found to be in one community on this graph get the same color. And it turns out, 
as you can see here, that you have a fair number of subsets, and in fact, you have a larger number than the number that was originally known in the retina. We actually found three new types. How do we know that these types are real? We found a bunch of cells that have similar expression. That's what we actually found. Neuroscientists, however, have worked on the retina for more than 100 years. Those beautiful stains from Ramon y Cajal started with the retina. And they have many ways by which they define cells. It's their morphology, what they actually look like, bipolar, one pull up, one pull down, but they also vary in other ways. It's where they laminate, they go in these layers. It's which other layer they will connect to. They have a whole series of these criteria. And all the other criteria in the retina, including electrophysiology, whether the neuron fires when the light turns on or light turns off, or you move to the right or you move to the left, all of these align one to one. And lo and behold, these groupings align one to one as well to all of those other ones which we have validated experimentally. And what is nice about that, that it means that we found three new electrophysiologies, three new morphologies, and three new laminations in those cells. They're unique in these properties, and they were hidden from our sight before. But this discovered them, and actually remarkably easily in less than a year from start of project to finish. Same story, these are those lovely dendritic cells, those immune cells in the blood, without belaboring all the technical steps, but basically taking the exact same approach here, but now to another cell type from another part of the body. This was the original classification of dendritic cells when the project started. This is the new classification of dendritic cells. And you might notice that some things that people thought were different have some new relationships that we didn't know existed. You might also notice that here was just one, and we actually now know that there are two different things inside that one bucket. So we, extra, we provided an extra split. Now, how could this impact what we know about disease? So here's an example for you. Another tissue. This is the trachea, the airway to the lung. This is about 7,000 cells from the trachea. And while this might look like a speckle on the slide, this is actually a non-trivial number of cells. And they formed their own little cluster. And the algorithm gave it its own little color. And we gave it its own little name, which was HOT. And the reason that we called it HOT is that we thought it was a HOT new finding. By now, it has a proper name. We wanted to know what they are. All we knew was they weren't like anything else that anyone knew existed already in the trachea. So we, we, we couldn't even find a name for them at first. So we looked at the RNAs that were inside them and that characterized them in a unique way, meaning that these are genes that are expressed only in these special cells, these few cells here that are all similar to each other and very different from everyone else but not anywhere else. Red and green here is higher level of the RNA, blue is lower level of the RNA. And we noticed two things. We noticed this gene is called FOXY1. That led to their name, the ionocyte, because there are other cells in other species with that gene called ionocytes, and they have certain functions. And what really shocked us is this gene. This gene is called CFTR. This is the cystic fibrosis gene. This is one of the first, if not the first, disease Mendelian gene to be cloned genetically in, in kind of the modern era. And everyone thinks it's expressed in ciliated cells, which are these guys, except that it's not. It's expressed in this new cell, which is very rare and very different. It is not expressed at all in ciliated cells, and so it is expressed in a new cell type, a very old gene. That's the kind of discovery that one can make, and you can validate this. This is human bronchus, and you can validate this in situ and confirm that this is indeed correct. This is not some, you know, miss of either algorithm or experimental approach. This is a much more traditional approach to follow with. Another example of the impact. This is now the human colon. This is healthy colon. You know, people after 50 usually get routine colonoscopies. Most of them, there's no findings. Some of them agree to participate as research subjects. They allow you to pinch a little extra biopsy from them. The biopsy is really small. It's like a poppy seed, and it has a few tens of thousands of cells in them. And from those cells, using this approach, this is over 10 healthy volunteers, you can identify 40 subsets in the colon, and these are just organized here. These are, for example, the epithelial cells. These are the connective tissue cells and also include the glia in this subset. Um, these are immune cells and then the immune cells, these just for visualization, we're showing separately the B cells, the T cells, and the myeloid cells. IBD is not like 
uh, inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis are diseases, especially ulcerative colitis, is a disease of the colon, it's an autoimmune disease. It's not like cystic fibrosis. It's not made by, it's not caused by one gene, and if you unfortunately have two defective copies, you actually will have the disease. There are many, many genes, and they each introduce some risk, and you might develop ulcerative colitis, or you might not. And these genes have been mapped by beautiful human genetic studies over the past decade or so. There are about 500 such loci, such places in the genomes that are roughly known. Now you can take those loci and you can ask, but in which cell in the colon are they used? Some of them are used by a lot of cells, but some of them are extraordinarily specific to one of these 40. And in some cases, it's exactly like the CFTR. We always thought it was there, but it's actually here. And if you want to now follow this in order to develop, say, an understanding of why this gene confers risk on disease, we had better know where to get started, and this gives us a map. Now, just to clarify that a lot of these things are difficult, and especially the analysis turns out to be quite hairy, I love this plot because these are four different approaches on exactly the same data, and you can see with your eyes that they're giving you different answers, and that does not make anyone happy because which of the answers is correct, and maybe none of them is. So the analytics is still often challenging and not sufficiently robust. It also has to be extraordinarily scaled because of that thing, which has now gone well beyond you know, the 6 million, and there will be 60 million, and then there will be a billion. And that starts getting to very large numbers that you have to think about analytically with much more efficient ways than we could have made with in the past. OK, enough about cell types. Now a little bit about structures. You remember the histology. The idea is very simple again. Imagine that this is the tissue, and tissue is organized. This is actually the top of an embryo, looking from the top on a zebrafish embryo relatively early on. Genes, uh, sorry, cells that reside here might express red genes, cells that reside here might express yellow genes, cells that are here might express blue genes. And so if I have a cell and it has a blue gene, a yellow gene, but not a red gene, I might be reasonably good at predicting that it came from here. So based on a few of these landmarks, I might take a lot of cells for which I have profiles and basically send them to their right location probabilistically. And this idea, again, surprisingly just works. And I'm showing you two examples here. This is that actual fish embryo, and this is a bunch of cells like that, that the algorithm predicted will be located in this. This is called the salt and pepper pattern. These are difficult to find because they don't just go with some, say, gradient from top to bottom. They're scattered all over the place. And this is the validation of the same thing in situ, and you can see them scattered all over the place. This is the hippocampus in the adult, and it has a particular structure. And these are subsets of cells, first identified exactly by this grouping of cells that I described to you. And this is the prediction of the algorithm of how they map along two regions, CA1 and CA3, of the hippocampus. And you can see their nice spatial patterns. And again, that was validated downstream with these types of spatial in situ assays. And so we can say that the expression profile basically has the imprint of where the cell lives, where the cell lives very locally and sometimes where the cell lives quite globally in an anatomical scale. And then we could connect this molecular profile of the cell with the place in which it resides. Why might this be useful for us? Well, it will tell us what tissue is made of, but again, it has these nice stories about impact. So this is a tumor type called head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. It is a very uh, um, it, is a, it, it is a tough one to have. And patients who receive, uh, you, you can obtain tumors from patients when they undergo resections, as was done here. And then you can look at the cells from these, um, at the cells from these patients, which are ordered here along the columns. And you can look at the genes from these, from these cells, which are ordered here around the rows. And the dark red describes high expression, and the blue describes low expression. And you can see that there's a subset of cells here which spans multiple patients that express a subset of genes. And they are related to a process called the EMT that makes cells kind of like shift their, 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 their behavior, okay? For now, Let, let's leave it at that. What is remarkable is that by these mapping approaches, you can discover that these cells don't reside anywhere in the tumor. They reside in what we call the invasive edge of the tumor, the part of the tumor that is actually making its way through the healthy tissue, which you can imagine is not a good for you thing. 
And not only are they at the invasive edge, they actually, their presence is associated, associated with having worse clinical outcome. And if we now can possibly use this in order to determine whether a patient needs to get a complete neck dissection, which is actually a dangerous procedure, or whether you can just take out the primary tumor and leave it at that. You can also imagine a day when, and this is really imagination from now, these are the classical way of staining tissue. These are called agent and E stains, and this is 150-year-old technology, and this is the one thing that one can guarantee you. If you have to have, unfortunately, a biopsy or another tissue assay in a hospital, will be done to this. That's still, the, 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 that's still part and parcel of clinical pathology today. And diagnoses are made based on this, and they're also made based on additional fancier assays that we know how to do, like staining proteins inside the tissue. But imagine a day where this would all be like a molecular microscope. You will make this image, but based on looking on enough examples of these tissues and these cells, you will measure this image, but we, you will know these genes using these mapping approaches. That would be nice. There are a lot of challenges in doing this. I want to highlight two, which people forget about. The first is in what we call canonical or healthy tissue. Presumably, it's always coming out the same. But the truth is that we're not the same. You know, here I am looking at you. I can assure you you're not the same. Some of us are taller than others. Some of us are younger than others. Some of us um, have different, uh, it's not just height, but our proportions are different. And so if I take one person and I get a piece of their colon, and I take another person, there is a piece of the colon, how do I know they came from the same place? This is not the same as lab animals that we can control to be quite remarkably the same. This is what we call in the field the common coordinate framework, and it turns out to be extraordinarily difficult to decide what are these common physical coordinates. And then if you think about non-canonical tissue, and the epitome of that is tumors, they never come back the same. That's part of what makes them wrong, is the fact that they're like misstructured. But they have features in them that are the same. That's what the pathologist recognizes and says, head and neck cancer, and they don't say something else. It's based on these features. And so can we reach a point where we find these similar features and we understand the cells and the molecules that are in them? And so all of these are big challenges for our field. They're not solved today, but that's what people are working on. So enough with histology. Let's move on to some dynamics. And so developmental biology, we all started from one cell. We're made of 37 trillion. Something had to get us there. And in particular, we're curious about the series of changes that happens to cells, not just the fact that they divide, but also that they modify and change that happens to cells during that time, these transitions. And so can we look at the molecules that are inside cells and order them. So now, two cells that are close to each other are maybe not the same, but maybe one represents things that happen early, and the other represents things that happened a little later, and then the one after that is like breadcrumbs, right? Or grains of sand. The other one is something that happened a little later, and a little later, and a little later, and a little later, and all of a sudden, it's connected dots. And I figured out the order of events. And it's not just that it's one line, because things start diversifying, right? We have all these different cell types. So here is one line leading to red blood cells and another one to neutrophils. That's another part of your immune system. And that's, this is the line that leads to T cells, and all of them come back and trace back to a stem cell, which made all of them. Can we do this? The answer is absolutely yes. And it turns out to work even though we actually can't go back in time. So our immune system remakes 10 to the 11 cells a day, okay? Most of them die, reborn, die and reborn. Makes them from very, very few stem cells at the root of this branching process that we have. If we take a sample of your bone marrow, where this all starts, there are some cells that, have, that are just at the beginning, and there are some cells that are the result of something that started a little earlier and a little earlier, and a little earlier, and a little earlier, so they're later and later and later and later into the process, and we have all of them in one snapshot. So usually, biologists fight against that. That's called asynchrony, and it's really difficult because everyone is mixed together. But in the single cell world, that's a gift, because everyone is mixed together. All I have to do is reorder them. 
And I assume that the ones who might be more similar, more close to each other in time would also be more similar to each other because it's a gradual process. And it turns out that it's just not a bad assumption. And so this example is neurogenesis. The adult hippocampus is one of the few parts of the brain that actually has ongoing neurogenesis. And if you analyze it, and this was collected along a process over time, you can actually exactly achieve this nice order. This is a bone marrow. And in this bone marrow, the stem cell lives somewhere around here. The number of cells here is almost a million, so it's, it's substantial. Sorry, almost half a million, so it is substantial. And that's why, again, these things become really, really dense and hard to tease apart. But there is a trajectory here. And here is a trajectory going there. And here is one going towards erythroid cells and so on. And this is, remember, the zebrafish? This is early zebrafish development, and you can see the beautiful spikes coming out, going into all of these sub and sub-sub lineages that are going to make an entire vertebrate organism. And all of these dots are single cells. And there are algorithms involved that try to tease out, both visually and analytically, this order of event, or what we call the pseudo-order of events, because it's not actually an order. All of these things were measured at the same time. Um, why could this be useful for people, besides being very fascinated with developmental biology? You can look at neurogenesis in the hippocampus, where you know it exists, but it turns out that if you go in the spinal cord, you can also find neurogenesis. And we didn't know definitively that it exists there. It's maybe a one in 5,000 neurons that ends up going through this path, but we can actually identify it and monitor it and even compare it to the other one that exists in the hippocampus. And this can give us hope to find cells and tissues that have regenerative potential and maybe have better codes to understand what governs this process towards reprogramming and regeneration. Another case where this is very useful for us is in cancer. So in cancers, not all cells are created equal. They're sort of like a caricature of a normal developmental process. And what I'm showing you here are two different types of glioma. Both of these are deadly cancers without a cure. Oligodendroglioma is considered low grade because it moves more slowly. It takes many years, many more years than some of the other gliomas, and it occurs in adults. This is DIPG. This is very sadly a high grade glioma. It is extraordinarily aggressive, and it happens in young children. This is one of the worst diseases you've never heard of or at least I've never heard of, and found it quite heart-wrenching to hear about. These are the malignant cells of these tumors, ordered in that way that I've described to you. And you can see that it looks like this inverted Y shape. And if you look at the genes that are actually in those little dots, in those little cells, you see that these cells look like a caricature. They're all cancer cells, but they look like a caricature of the progenitors of neural cells and glia, called neural progenitor cells. These cells look like a caricature of the progenitors of oligodendrocytes, a specific type of glia, of support cells of the brain. The color that I'm showing here is whether the cell is cycling or not. I haven't gotten to states yet, but I will preempt by telling you that I can tell, based on the genes in the cell, whether it's dividing right now. And you might notice that only these cells have color in them. They're the only ones that are dividing. They are basically what is going to kill the patient because they're going to divide and make more of them. And the rest of them are basically following this caricature of differentiation and then stop divide. What we need to kill is this. It doesn't help us if we kill any of the others. And now we know that they're there. And they're actually quite rare. And we can start looking for their unique genes and their unique features and start going after them. I'm going to skip this and move to physiology to make sure that I cover all the things I wanted to tell you. And so in physiology, we think about transient processes, but also about the fact that things can just span a continuum. So if these are, again, in caricature form, if this is a bunch of cells, I can no longer group them into groups, right? There is no place to pass a dividing line. I also cannot just say, well, they stretch along a trajectory. They don't just follow one path. They're like this cloud. But this cloud is not uniform. I'm coloring this cloud based on, for example, a program, a set of genes that I know is important for something. 
versus, for example, if these are immune cells, whether they would be inflammatory and enhance the immune response, or whether they would be reg regulatory and dampen the immune response. And the more I go to the right, the more inflammatory they look. The more I go to the left, the more regulatory I look, but there's no place where I can push the line and say all of these are one thing and all of these are another thing. That's actually very common for cells. They span the spectrum, and I want to understand that. And so here are two examples of these kinds of continuums that exist in uh, uh, biological systems. One is the cell cycle. I am ordering the cells here, and they actually are forming a very lovely cycle that's the same human glioma you saw before. All of the cells inside the cycle, starting here, here, and these, are actually cells that are cycling. And this big blob over here are all the cells that are actually out of the game. They're not dividing, and they're not cycling at all. This is another process. This is the process of dendritic cells that have seen a component of a pathogen called LPS. And this is early, after they've seen it for an hour, for two hours, and for four to six hours. And again, you can see this nice march of time. So we have two things. We have dynamic processes that we want to order. That's just like cell differentiation that I showed you before, like developmental biology. But we also have these plastic spectra, just the fact that they span a spectrum and just sit there. And this one on one end of the spectrum, this one on that end of the spectrum, and someone in the middle. And we want to be able to distinguish them, to order them, and to characterize these things. Again, where could this be useful for us? I'm using, again, an example from cancer. In this case, the cancer is melanoma. And what we're thinking about is resistance. We treat patients all the time, and yet our treatments still fail. And the vast majority of patients who die from cancer die because they become, their tumors become resistant to the treatments that we provide. They are either intrinsically resistant, the treatment doesn't work to begin with, or they, are, they have acquired resistance. They start sensitive, and all of a sudden the tumor become resistant, or as we hear it, the cancer came back. There are two styles of therapy today for melanoma. There is immunotherapy, which is remarkably successful for a subset of patients, and there is targeted therapy, which is targeted against specific, specific genes that are mutated and that the um, malignant cell depends on. And in both cases, we find small minorities of cells that are already resistant to the therapy in patients that have not seen the therapy yet, that are naive to it. Here are a bunch that are resistant to targeted therapy, and you can see the spectrum of the cells. This end is resistant, this end is sensitive, but there's no breaking point. And this is a set of genes that characterize resistance to immunotherapy versus sensitivity to immunotherapy. These are the patients that are resistant, and their cells look resistant. These are the patients that have not been treated. In general, their cells look sensitive, but look at these guys over here. They actually look like resistant ones, and they're present there before the immunotherapy was even there. At the very least, we know something about the outcome from these things, and ideally, we will find ways, of course, to circumvent that. Another example of this, not from the cancer setting, is in allergy and asthma. This is a case where we're looking at immune cells. These are special kinds of immune cells called innate lymphoid cells. We're looking at mice here, not at patients yet, that are challenged with house mi dust mite. And again, the cells don't break in any obvious place. They form this spectrum. This end of the spectrum looks like it is, is not very inflammatory, and it's probably not going to induce an asthmatic or allergic response, whereas this end is very inflammatory and looks like it does. You can look for genes that make the difference. One of them turns out to be this gene. It's called NMUR. NMU is a neuropeptide. This is a receptor to a neuropeptide, and it allowed us to actually find that these cells talk to the nervous system, or rather, to the ends of the nerves inside the lungs. Okay. And so these are the things that we would learn from the atlas. We will know the taxonomy of the cell types. We will find how they're organized in histological tissues. We will identify their developmental trajectories. We will figure out their physiology, all these transient states. There are also things that the atlas will allow us to do, which the atlas itself of healthy humans will not tell us, but it will open the road towards. One of them is molecular mechanisms, the ability to really identify not just that we have all these cells, but figure out what controls them. 
What makes one cell become a different one? What maintains a cell as a specific type and doesn't let it become a different one? What is driving all of these processes? And this is done by molecular circuitry. That's the subject of a whole other uh, talk, how that is done. But we can look for it based on these patterns of variations between genes inside our cells. So by seeing who is changing together with whom under either the native state or when we manipulate the native state, we can start guessing at who is actually the contr at the control. I already talked about disease. I want to make one important point about it. When you try to study disease with bulk methods, we usually need to look at a lot of patients. But for every patient, we basically get one of these profiles. We take, say, the tumor and we mush it up. We have the smoothie, we get one profile. When we study with single cell genomics, we usually still study a relatively small number of patients. But from every patient, we get a very large number of profiles. We could get tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands from a single specimen. So we call these studies large N, small K studies, and these studies small N, large K, where K is the number of individual profiles per each specimen, and N is the number of specimens. And what is beautiful about the small N, large K studies is that for a very small number of examples of actual individuals that we study, we can answer all of these. This is an example of a tumor of melanoma. We can find the taxonomy of these cells. We can figure out how they're organized in the tissue. We can find different evidence of physiology, like resistance and the types of immune cells that are there, and even the interactions between the cells by looking at very, very few examples. But from each of these examples, seeing a whole lot and at much better resolution. The last thing that this helps us understand is the relationship between human and its many models. There are many things that we cannot do in humans, and we'll never do in humans. But we can do in cell lines in a dish, in organoids that we grow in a dish, and in model organisms. And one of the problems is that we often don't know how would things that we've seen in one relate to the other. We sometimes think that they actually would relate kind of badly because the one fruit smoothie and the other fruit smoothie look quite different and we don't realize that they both have bananas, say. And so this is where this high resolution approach really helps us because we can look at things at a much better resolution than we could before and we can compare the compositions. This is actually here uh, hippocampus and prefrontal cortex done for human and for mouse and the colors actually match between these two. So even though the proportions might be different, and there are some things that would be truly different, we would be comparing apples and apples and not apples and oranges. So these are all the things the atlas will enable. Hopefully I convinced you that it might actually give us interesting answers to questions that impact human health, although in its own right, it's a very basic research project. And if it is actually worthwhile to do, the question then becomes how to do it. So I want to spend the last very few minutes of this talk telling you a little bit about how a community of scientists comes together and thinks about how to do something and not just whether to do something. And this is quite a difference from everything I showed you until now, which is basically research from my lab. There was a postdoc or a grad, stu a grad student or both of them together, and they had some system and they're interested in a question, and they study it and they get great results and they publish a paper, all of which is wonderful and what I intend to continue doing. But some of these things just don't scale well. And also, they lead to a haphazard set of results, whereas there is maybe the potential to really put all of them in a single framework together. And so when one starts thinking about projects like these, one has to be very, very careful. And this is one of my favorite writers and definitely one of my favorite stories of one of my favorite writers, Jorge Luis Borges, who is an was an Argentinian writer, uh, mostly in the fantastic style. And this is a story from 1946 called An Exactitude in Science. This is an excerpt, but the full story is about one line longer than my excerpt. And so it says, in that empire, the art of, it tells you about a finding in a library, and there's this little excerpt in the library, and you can see that it is purportedly from Suarez Miranda, Travels of Prudent Men, Book 4, Chapter. This is all complete fiction, just so it's clear. And that's just a very Jorge Luis Borges thing. And it says, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, 
and the Cartographer's Guild struck a map of the empire, whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point to point with it. If this is your map, it's useless. It loses the entire essence of a map, which is an abstraction at the right level of resolution that lets you see things. But that's the big trap. And that's a trap that you have to be very cautious about. How do you know that you've done something comprehensively without having done it exhaustively? A new person is born every day, and they're going to have some changes in their DNA that are private to them. They don't exist in any of the other people who is walking the earth. And yet, we still have a pretty good notion of the human genome, and then on top of that, of human genetic variation, the common part. And if we needed to know what happens in that person, we have a way of measuring that. That's the question, how to do that for cells. And cells are worse than DNA, okay? That one person has their 37 trillion cells, but moreover, they just had breakfast. And the cells are doing something different. And now they're going down for a nap. And the cells are doing something different too. And also it was a newborn. And now it's a three month old. And their cells are completely different again. So it's tough. It's tougher than with DNA. That's important to remember. But lessons can be learned. So this analogy to the Human Genome Project we found very useful up to a point. There were units, the genes versus our cells. They were fundamental at some deep level of understanding. In the Human Genome Project, we had to worry about variation between individuals, but consensus is useful. And the same is true in the Human Cell Atlas. Each cell is different, and it changes all the time. But there is some consensus, because when we look at actual data, it doesn't look like you're jumping all over the place. It looks like there is a restricted level in the space where they're allowed to jump. And what was extremely useful for the Human Genome Project is that people didn't just decide to do it alone. They set it up as an international collaboration across communities, and it was made possible also by new technologies, in that case sequencing. And the truth is, when they started convincing it, PCR was not yet invented. Yeah. And yet, for those who know, and yet they actually started it and somehow PCR miraculously appeared. I say we're in better shape than that. And so what did people learn by doing, um, by doing transformative projects like these over the years? That it's important to have a comprehensive approach. The unit has to be fundamental. You want to do something that would really like thousands and thousands and thousands of labs do things that otherwise they couldn't do or that they would spend extraordinarily amount of efforts repeatedly in ways that are kind of uninteresting to do individually. It has to be audacious, but it actually has to be tractable. It's not enough that it sounds cool. You have to have an idea on how to execute it. You need a technology landscape that is sufficiently favorable to get started, but where you see that it's constantly evolving. The costs go down, the scales go up, new opportunities open all the time, and that's definitely true for single cell and spatial genomics. There has to be intellectual flexibility because the goals are going to evolve. There has to be very deep commitment to quality control and a very rigorous focus on transparency in that. You have to be willing to really be open with what you're doing or, you can, or everyone um, is in kind of bad shape. International collaborations are good for the world in these days more than ever. You want to have strong leadership, but the leadership has to be the scientists themselves. It's no one from the outside and they choose them and they replace them whenever needed. You want large places and small groups to contribute in a way that reflects what they want to do, the capacity that they have and the strengths that they have. You want to have the ability to share your data with an appropriate infrastructure. There have to be regular meetings so that people are actually together. Everything needs to be out in the open, the data, the technologies. You want to be able to communicate what you're doing so that everyone understands, scientists, funders, the general public, Ethics matters, these are humans, but also global equity, meaning it cannot just be like the old maps that were made with Western eyes. It has to be globally equitable, and you will need supportive funders. Um, and that led to a set of values for the group of scientists that came together, that we will be transparent, that all data will be open, openly and immediately shared, not shared after you write a paper, shared after you generated your data, that the quality will be a critical thing for us, that we will be flexible about approaches, that community building will be as important as everything else, that we will be diverse both in the scientists that participate, in the samples that participate, and the diversity is not just genetic diversity, it's also geographic diversity. The same genome in two different countries is not the same cells. Um, 
privacy is important and ethics is important, and we have to be also cognizant of the fact that this is very different for different communities around the world, that we will have to technologically innovate both within and without and excel, and the same is true, if, if not more so, for the computational side. So sort of a Google map for the human body. Google map is a many resolution type of thing. This is the city of Cambridge. This happens to be my house. And that's a map, and that's a map. And this is, of course, at very fine resolution, but you kind of only see my house, and if we drilled in, we would see my daughter's bedroom. And this is at a higher resolution, of course, it could be the state of Massachusetts, the United States, the Earth, and so on. We've all seen those drilling in and drilling out, but it's nice to think about that in the context of our maps as well, because we decided that we're actually going to parse out a first draft before we would make a comprehensive atlas. There are actually statistical reasons why we think these numbers are kind of good, 30 to 100 million cells. Um, and the tissues in which they're embedded, and here are maybe 1 to 10 billion cells. And you have to bound. You have to bound the resolution that you will achieve, how much of disease you're actually going to take on, or it becomes all of biology, how much diversity are you going to take on. You want to be fully, you want to be diverse, but that does not mean that you're going to be able to do genetic mapping for everything. That's not the same. And whether function, whether understanding what the cells do is part of the project, or is something that everyone characterizes after. Again, think about the Human Genome Project. They found the genes. They didn't actually figure out what each gene does. And actually, we don't know yet what each gene does. But if we didn't have the genes, we wouldn't know that we even need to figure out what they're doing. And so these are kind of the rough bounds of the atlas. How to build it is interesting. Here's a human. You first need to get tissues, and you need to decide which tissues, and how do you get them, and from where. And then what do you measure on them? And so we define two types of branches. And then how do you go through each of these branches? And these become quite specific and technical. How do you actually know that you're doing in the most cost-effective, fast, and appropriate way a proper sampling of what is out there? And so we had to make a bunch of decisions. The first one was not all the human body at once. We're gonna, we first identified 12 systems. How do we identify 12 organ systems and tissues? Well, no one specific actually sat in a room and stood up a committee that sat and decided. These are the communities that formed. So the neuroscientists and the immunologists and the kidney people and the lung and trachea people and the liver people and the pancreas people, they actually stood up and they said, I want to do the pancreas. No one yet stood up, as Sarah Teichman, my good colleague, likes to say, for the big toe, but it will come, but there is a big skin community. Okay? And they identified different areas in our skin that they're going to go after. And in fact, that's another important point. This is not yet organs. This is only histology and tissue level, which is a very big difference. You're not yet building a whole brain or figuring out a whole gastrointestinal tract, but you're knowing something about each of the key anatomical locations in those. Where do you get your tissues from is a question. We're talking about humans. And there's a trade-off, and you're going to see these trade-offs now one after the other. This is a trade-off between getting things that are both fresh and came from perfectly healthy individuals to sampling old tissues. There are some things you can get from perfectly healthy individuals, a blood draw. Most people volunteer for that. That's not a big deal. But there are very few things like that, and they don't reside here, for example. You can get all tissues in post-mortem examinations, and people do that. But that's a very different type of endeavor. And then there are all sorts of things in between, including biopsies and resections, that might represent something close to healthy, but might not necessarily be perfectly so. So sampling humans is an interesting question. And you have to have a very careful physical tracking system, because we don't yet know how to actually map organs of multiple different people into the same coordinate framework, but at least we know how to measure in 3D coordinates. Cartesian coordinates, so we want to keep a record of that so that we will future-proof the way in which we collect our samples. We'll have two equal branches, one for cellular measurements, the fruit salad, and one for spatial measurements, the, um, the, the fruit tart. These are emerging more recently than these in kind of genomic or semi-genomic scale, but fortunately almost all of these can be applied to tissue that has already been frozen or fixed which means you can actually preserve your specimens and come back to them in two years when you feel that the method is ready for them. Whereas these often require tissue that is brand new and fresh and you have about two hours to process it, and so you have to just go with whatever you have. 
How do we know that we got it right? We thought about that a lot, and we identified three measures. One is reproducibility. If I did it one time and I did it another time, then by the same set of measures, I want to get the same thing. If I did one retina and another retina, I want to get the same subsets of cells from both retinas. One blood draw, another blood draw. One bone marrow, another bone marrow, and so on. We want to have integrity. This is not integrity in the moral sense, but rather integrity to the tissue itself. If a tissue is made of a certain set of cells and they have certain proportions, we want to appropriately capture all of those cells in the correct proportions with the molecules that are actually there. And then we want to have some predictive value, meaning that if we identified a subset of cells that we think is a type based on some set of measures, say RNA, we want it to somehow map to something else in the world that is not just that measure itself. To be able to predict that there will also be maybe cells with that RNA might have a certain shape, might live in a certain place in the body, might perform a particular function, that there would be another aspect to them that is not just the thing by which I define them initially that is also discreetly identifiable, and so this would be the predictive value. We need new technologies. I'm going to skip on that. What I don't want to skip on is that we need algorithms, analysis, and portals, ways for the world to interact with this kind of data. All of those things I showed you today were made by computational algorithms followed by visualization tools, and most of them are available. At least their data and some of their visuals is available in open source portals for people to actually access. And that leads to the fact that we need a place for all of that to reside. And that is what we call the data coordination platform. This is actually a big software engineering project across four different um, sites, three in the US and one in the UK. And who all work together. The colors actually represent roughly their partitioning to build a place to ingest the data, to store the data, to process the data, and to, build port and to allow others to build portals to the data that would both do additional processing of it and present it to the world. This is all open source and open data, meaning the code itself is available to anyone and the data that it carries inside is available to anyone and the whole thing can be fully clonable and we call it the data coordination platform or the DCP. We've started in October 2016. That was our kickoff. It meant that a bunch of people got together in London and started saying, ah, we think it's kind of a good idea and we'd like to tell our friends as well. We have done a full year of planning, including a focused process around technologies, analysis, a jamboree for some of the computational analysis, um, a workshop around these coordinates, and a full general meeting. During this process, we wrote a white paper that describes many of the things that I talked to you about today that's available online, and we launched the, the, and we launched the data coordination platform here in June. We launched the build of the data coordination platform. There's already been more than one end-to-end -end demo of the thing actually working, and data collection itself was launched in October 2017 in the annual meeting in Rehovot. This is a completely open organization. It has a little bit of loose structure. It has an organizing committee. As I already mentioned, my colleague, Sarah Teichmann, but there are, um, there are currently 28 additional ones, and we hope to fill in with additional members. We have very nice funders, and the funders are growing. We do some actual work of organization, and we have a registry, and it's open to anyone who's willing to join. There's no, you don't have to have money. You don't have to have done something already. You just have to be willing to follow these principles that are laid out in the beginning. And people are actually doing that, and they're contributing data. This is one of the first data sets. I actually showed you a little bit of this data on one of the slides earlier on. It's a one million uh, cell pilot, all from the immune system, bone marrow, cord blood, and peripheral blood. These are the pictures of the people who actually contributed it, and they collected this data, and then they give it online, which is a nice thing to have. It's actually not yet online, because it's waiting for the final IRB approval, but it shall be. We span a good part of the world. We're still working on Latin America, but other than that, we're pretty much um, everywhere and uh, growing. And with this, I will finish. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Today. Well, <clears throat> we have time for a few questions. There's a procedure for questions. Oh, you have to raise your hand. And Long enough for there's somebody a with a microphone. There are three microphones. There's a red microphone, there's a green microphone, there's a blue microphone. They will bring it to you. And when you get the microphone and it looks like it's your turn, stand up, tell us your name, tell us if you're a member, and ask a question. One minute. One minute, wait. 
little more. Um, for our uh, listeners and viewers online, please use the comment box to ask a question. We have uh, somebody monitoring, and we will pick a few questions from our online audience. David Rosen, lifetime member. What about things like the HeLa and other cell contamination sources? Does that interfere with your stuff? So, so this is done usually on human tissues rather than on things like cell lines. What this helps a great deal for cell lines is that it actually gives you a way to determine what is there. So for example, if your cell line culture is actually contaminated with something else, you would very readily identify it by running it through one of these uh, single cell genomic processes very easily. However, the actual atlas itself is built off of healthy humans and their tissues, rather than through things that were derived outside of the human body. So it represents humans in the human body. The human body has actually been a big barrier for doing human biological research, because most of the time we couldn't. We don't do experiments on people. We do clinical trials, which are appropriately done and ethically done, but we don't do experiments on people. And in fact, most of the samples that used to come from people are very small because they're biopsies. You don't take more than you absolutely need. And they were too small for many of the measurements methods, these more modern ones. So when you get to a measurement method that's as small as one cell, you're actually in a very favorable place to start studying humans. Red microphone in the back there. Uh, hi, Joel, uh, member of the society. Thank you for your presentation. Kind of a two-part question. When you're talking about single-cell genomics, I wonder if that goes into what's called personalized medicine. Maybe some of those um, ideas can help with that. And the other one is when you talk about this 20,000-dimensional space, there's a lot of work done already mathematically with vector spaces. So if you treat the genes as basis vectors, yes. um, I'm wondering if you could kind of characterize it in that fashion, maybe take shadows and fit, look at certain portions of the, of the potential table. So let me, let, me, let me answer each question in turn. The first question was about precision medicine. Yes, we actually consider these types of approaches to give another facet to precision medicine. Much of the early work in precision medicine, not all of it, was very genetically oriented. It looked at the DNA. And that was because you could also measure that very precisely and feel very confident about what you see. This issue with smoothies is far less of an issue for the genome because there is far less diversity in the genome between the cells. And for a long time, people didn't feel that these other measurements were reliable enough for precision medicine because every time a smoothie was a little bit different, right? And so you wouldn't know and things, it was tough. This actually gives you this high resolution lens and becomes very meaningful for precision medicine. So imagine a patient who needs to go on immunotherapy. There's a set of genetic correlates that might be useful for immunotherapy, but the vast majority of whether the patient would or would not respond and whether there will be resistance or not has to do with what kind of immune cells it has inside the tumors and what kinds of malignant cell states, not genetics, it has inside the tumor. And now you would be able to measure those and make a predictor and use that predictor in other patients. So absolutely part of precision medicine. You can also think about things like the blood count, the complete blood count, especially the white cell blood count, is one of the most um, applied uh, minimally invasive tests in medicine. It's a single cell assay. They count how many there are of, I believe, seven different subsets of immune cells. All they do is count them in seven subsets. Just those dendritic cells, which are actually the rarest subset of uh, immune cells in the blood, they're just 1% of peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Just those dendritic cells, you could see early on, they come in multiple different flavors in the blood. And that's before I ask which pathogen they've seen. If I consider that as well, I come with all their many states that could also be in the blood. And they could be extremely informative about the type of infection that the person has had, about where the status of the tumor from which these immune cells extravasated and went back to the bloodstream, about the status of their nervous system. Immune cells go everywhere in the body and come out, and go everywhere and come out. You could make a much richer test based on this kind of information. So that's another level of precision in medicine. The second question, absolutely, that's what actually people do. So that um, image that I showed had first the 20,000 genes, and that had imposed on that another set of axes. You can think of those as basis vectors, yes. But the issue with a lot of these things is that they're not perfectly orthogonal to each other. So basis vectors are, and in biology, it's kind of, but kind of not. 
So to some extent, yes, there is a set of genes that characterizes the cell. And then there's another thing going on, is the cell dividing or not? And cell division is kind of similar between different cells, except that in stem cells, it's a little different than in everyone else. So that's why it's not perfectly orthogonal, and we don't fully understand what it is. But what we do know from many other uh, fields in which large amounts of data are organized in high dimensional space is that we have wonderful methodologies to draw on. And we also have a feeling that maybe biological data is organized a little bit different than some of the data that other fields have looked at. And so it could bring in something interesting to math and to computer science. And we're actually seeing the first beginnings of that, where this type of data looks different. And so it suggests interesting new mathematical and computational ideas. Yeah. Green. I'm Jim Griffin, and I'm a member. Uh, you started out with the periodic table of the elements, which I gather is an ultimately simple thing compared to the human cell atlas. And my takeaway fair, I have two questions. First, is, is my fair my takeaway that the best an analog you have to the periodic table is a multi-dimensional uh, collection of not graphs, but tables? Is that a fair? I think, I think the way I would think of it, and also following on what I told the earlier, uh, in response to the earlier question, it could be that the elements in the table will be the actual cells. It could also be that the elements of the table will be those quote-unquote basis vectors, meaning you would have a set of components from which you can compose cells and a set of rules by which cells get composed. Okay. And, and that would be a very different conception than the cataloging that I presented so far, which is solid and based on actual things that were actually done. But that could end up being a deep and meaningful answer. Because what was beautiful about the periodic table, and it still is about the periodic table of the elements, and I think when people take you know, their first chemistry class and they realize that that's the case, is that there were these holes and there was a set of principles that says an element shall exist there, even though we have never seen that element. And it might have taken many years after Mendeleev passed away until the element itself was actually seen. But there was a principle that said that it should exist. We do not have that for cells nor do we know that we will ever have that for cells because there is a big difference between biology and physics and chemistry. Okay. There's a deep inherent difference because one is a system under evolution and the okay. others are not. But it might, okay. or it might sort of, and if it does, that would give us something magnificent. So the second question is, in the periodic table, when you had it and when you had the empirical elements, you could have imagined that if you used the theory which went into the periodic table, you could have predicted the atomic reality. Or you could have looked at it as an empirical thing which suggested to you a pattern. The question is, is there any comparable theory in cell biology which might enable you to predict some one of these multi-dimensional chains yeah. that you've constructed? So the, an the honest answer today is no. And that is a source of huge consternation uh, to certain types of people, like me. That actually goes to that point about molecular mechanisms. If we want to get to the point that we can say there should exist something like this because these connections exist or potential for connections exist, we need to understand the mechanisms that give rise to that and the genetics that gives rise to that, that the combinations of genes that actually control this or that process. That's kind of a parallel path to doing the atlas. The atlas is extraordinarily empowering to it because if you're kind of walking in the dark and you don't even know which cells you're working on, you're not going to do very well on that. But also because these technologies turn out to also be the perfect match for this other type of problem. It's just a matter for a whole other lecture. But we don't know. And that cell type I showed at some point called the innate lymphoid cell is a relatively recent discovery. Some people claim that it was kind of predicted they would exist based on principles, and some people claim, no, we kind of just stumbled into it. I don't want to comment on that. I don't have a strongly held opinion. But I think in general, we don't really predict that something exists. We observe it still in biology. And we want to get to a point that we know whether this is just with us to stay because it's something inherent to biology, or whether there is a, a level for a system that we've observed enough of that we could also generalize something and predict something. Red microphone. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah, my name is uh, Carissa. I'm a first-time visitor here. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. And I'm very excited about this Human Cell Atlas project that you have um, going on. But I'm really curious, though, as in regards to the talk of having open data and then as well as the technology being open, I'm really curious as to why the Human Cell Atlas community decided to go with having open source code technology rather than free software technology that would preserve the freedom and openness, you know, beyond maybe the lifetime of the people in the community right now. Yeah. So I would first say that uh, the community that this grew out of is a very open community. And there are many sub-communities in science. This one comes from both the side of genomics, which tends to be very open with data, code, and tools, and also the technology side of it is extraordinarily open and in fact is remarkably so for a field that is technologically driven. In technology, usually, especially when it's really fast evolving, there is a risk that people presume exists when they expose their greatest next idea. This community actually exposes and that's why it moves so fast. And everyone in it recognizes that they all gain, all ships rise and so on. So it has a little bit of a culture like this to begin with. However, I will also say that in, in our field, open source has proven itself as an extraordinarily good way of sustaining code over long periods of time. And this is partly because it is so deeply driven out of the nonprofit and academic world, where there is kind of an ongoing, evolving, and the code base is top notch. It's not, I, I, I'm not talking about the past, I'm talking about the code base of this is, you know, quite top-notch and is designed by kind of the, the most recent and advanced standards. Okay, I just want to be really clear yeah. though. Um, when people say open source, I mean, there's a certain philosophy to that. Right. And then there's a different kind of code that would be under free software, which secures more freedom than open source does, whereas open okay. source can be closed at Okay, some point. no, no, you went to a finer level of resolution. Yes, than very I fine, but this I want to be very careful. This is under very good licenses, if this is what you were concerned yeah, with. Yeah, very concerned. No, so this is under uh, an MI, I believe all. I don't want to be on the record in the wrong way on licenses, but I believe this is all under an MIT BSD license, which is considered to be a very good approach and okay. non-contaminating, and so I, I, that's a critical principle for us. Okay, I yeah. think that. And by the way, question. if you're curious about the specific one, you can go online, both in the white paper and in the GitHub of the DCP, and see all the specifics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Blue microphone here, and there are a couple other hands, so if microphone runners will. Okay, two questions. One, one is, both of them are actually kind of quick. So the first one is about funding. I love the way you, you pointed to the funders. You said they were very nice. Your funders are always, always, always very nice. When, when I think about also how big of a biology project this is, it's absolutely enormous, about as big as I've yeah. ever heard. Do you have an estimate, if, if you were to reach a, an endpoint that you yeah. are proud of with this project, of yeah. how much that would cost? Yeah. So first of all, let me make a point about the funding because it's unusual for this one. Most of these initiatives in the, I would say in the last 10 to 20 years, didn't, didn't evolve exactly as this one has. This was a conscious decision on the side of the scientific, ac uh, uh, you know, active research community to get together and start laying the groundwork, even though there wasn't a dollar or a pound or you know, whatever, a euro involved, or a yen. A shekel. Or a shekel, <laughs> or a yuan. I just want to be clear because people from all of these countries immediately participated and that's unusual. We actually considered that to be a wonderful opportunity. Funders were invited but it wasn't like an advocacy. It was in order to think together about what makes science, scientific sense before, it, because funding for example tends to be at the national or you know, European Union or China and so on and that's how it should be. But we do want an internationally, scientifically coherent activity to exist as well. And it seems to work well in that sense. The magnitude is something that is difficult to calculate financially in a very precise way, also because of the way science funding works. I would say that this, this is not necessarily the most expensive of them all. And one of the reasons for that is that, in fact, just in the one year, from when we launched the planning process to when we launched the actual collection, 
everything precipitously declined, as we predicted that it would. And that's because the technologies have become extraordinarily favorable, and also because all sorts of tricks around sampling and how you can sample at different levels, both the cells and the tissues, but also the actual measurements downstream. So it's, it's interesting times. We're thinking that uh, for first draft, a flagship project, which would be maybe an organ or a tissue, to kind of sign up for that, for a project at that level, maybe 20 to 50 million, which is, you know, not too bad. And you would get a lot for less than that, but you wouldn't get the full thing. You would get a lot of information. A lot of the things I told you, that's shoestring science. It's not expensive science. But to get to the full scale, which is really important in comprehensive projects, you do have to put in more. And also, everything that you build in the process feeds off everyone else. That's what happened, you know, with genome sequencing, for example. You had a second question. I do. A second question, um, uh, it, it has to do with the complexities that you talked about, which are absolutely amazing. Uh, my mind is still reeling from it all. But I actually want to bring in yet another, another one. one. So I'm talking about epigenetics. You talked to, yes. So there, there's 20-some thousand yeah. genes. So we have a 20-some thousand dimension mathematical space to try to think about how to characterize all of these cells. But now you bring in this, all the sets of for the framework of switches that Bring determines which genes are on or which are. So where does the epigenetic framework fit into yeah. this project? So first, to be fair, for simplicity in the talk, I did not really go through, oops, oh, I know longer have a slide. Oh, yeah, I do. I not really go into details here, but you might notice somewhere I used to have this. Thank you. Um, you might notice that here, in what we call massively parallel methods, all those beautiful little dots of RNA, that, that, of cells with RNA, you have two techniques here. One of them is actually a technique about where the chromatin is open. So a lot of the choice of which technique to use where goes actually with what's available in the actual world, but there is at least one epigenomic technique that actually scales like the methods I showed for RNA. And the dimensions are not just 20,000 as a result, the dimensions are actually larger the 20,000 in their non-reduced form, but they do reduce because these measurements are not all independent from each other in a cell. Genes go up and down together, regions of chromatin open together and close together, and so on. So it is absolutely part and parcel, part of the identity of the cell. For the simplicity of this particular talk, I just didn't drill in into every detail. Epigenomic techniques are improving all the time. The way that we think about this is that we actually go through this stratified, we call this the skydive, when we, on the cellular branch, you have usually a trade-off between the molecular depth and richness of information. For example, histone modifications would be a rich information. Lots of different RNA species would be very molecularly deep into the cell. You have a trade-off between this and the number of cells. And all we have seen, both from a theoretical perspective and an actual empirical perspective so far, has been that veering towards more cells early is more important than having a lot of information on every cell that you measure. And so the skydive starts with what we call uniform, a uniform step where you just take a tissue and do a certain amount out of it, say a certain number of cells profiled shallowly. Based on those, you have a first level of understanding of what's there and you can start stratifying. If 70% of the cells, as is the case in, um, in, the, retina seven, in the retinal neurons, 70% of the cells are rods and they're all one type. You might want to put them in one bucket and look at the rest instead of constantly only looking at rods. Whereas retinal ganglion cells are 0.5% of the retinal neurons and there are at least 50 sub subtypes in them. We thought there are 20 something. We actually know there are 50 now because we ran the experiment. But you had to first stratify into them. But imagine you didn't know that at all. So we kind of simulated that. We actually ran a whole retina. We figured out the biggest components. Now we can start stratifying. And once you stratify, you, you basically reiterate the same level. And in any stratification, you always keep one bucket, which is your old negative bucket, and so on. And that's how you drill in. That's why we call it the skydive. You start, you look very broadly, but you don't see details. And then you narrow down as you go, but you only see very narrowly and very deeply. And epigenomics right now fits there. If the techniques get better, epigenomics goes all the way to the top. I think we have a, oh, you have a red microphone. There you go. Uh, Marjorie Silverstein. I couldn't figure out the system with the red and the blue. I wasn't <laughs> listening attentively. Marjorie Silverstein, I've got, I've got a couple questions. Go for it. Uh, first of all, uh, have you considered uh, 
the obtaining the samples. You spoke earlier about how hard it is to obtain samples from humans uh, because of, well, many reasons. But have you considered a, plan, a program, for example, when there's surgery, to take even just a to, uh, the the to take a swab sample or a teeny sample just on a regular surgery, a heart surgery, a stomach surgery. If somebody has to sign a form, they sign a form. But it's very easy to obtain the sample from invasive when there's already an invasive something happening. And then you take it. And then the second thing, so you have a whole lot more opportunity to obtain samples from inaccessible areas. And then there comes, you know, the hair, the skin, and all those are very easy to obtain. But then it would also be very interesting in addition to that, once you have that sample, to actually talk to that person about their pattern of life, about how they live, and then create a database and a sampling about how this all fits together, an extra layer of dimensionality in addition to the sample. And then the third layer of this track it, yeah, and then you track it across lifetime, so keep a longitudinal thing. So have you done that? Are you let planning me, on doing uh, something let, like that? Let, let me parse it out, okay? I'll start with where samples come from in, in actual human beings, and then I'll turn into this more epidemiological question. So in terms of samples, there are several sources of samples. You can obtain biopsies and resections. Resections are actually surgeries. <coughs> Um, when a piece of tissue comes out of the body, whereas a biopsy is without, you know, it's just a biopsy. Um, the limitation, especially of biopsies, or as you've described, just a little extra pinch from whatever is being uh, operated on, is that it doesn't give you appropriate anatomical sampling. Okay? It's too haphazard. It's a little bit here and a little bit there, but there are all these anatomical consideration cells actually are different in one location of a tissue versus another location of a tissue, and that, that introduces substantial limitations, especially as you move from first draft, which is histology level and it matters less, to ultimate atlas, which is anatomy level and you want to know the full organ and its structure. Um, but biopsies are extremely important, um, as are certain types of resections, because they do get us very, very close to healthy and because they are obtained fresh, which means that you can actually isolate cells. If you work with frozen or fixed tissue, you can no longer isolate intact cells you actually usually work with their nuclei, which I didn't talk about, but is another technological advance. On the other end of the spectrum are post-mortem examinations. There was actually a beautiful study that was funded by the NIH Common Fund called the uh, Genotype uh, Tissue Expression Project, I believe, or GTEx. And uh, this study was done, all, was, not, was done before the days of single-cell genomics, was done in bulk tissues isolated post-mortems from individuals, I believe 50 different um, organ and tissue types. Um, it has actually just concluded one of its, ma its final phase, and there was a series of very interesting um, news reports in Nature about this, where the family members of the donors of some of these tissues, family members actually have to donate, Th these are individuals who passed away, said how meaningful it was for them that, um, that, that they had this experience of participating, participation in this research. So this is actually quite meaningful both for patients and for family members to participate as research subjects. Um, in a post-mortem examination, there is an opportunity to sample any tissue and complete organs um, as appropriate given the consents that are given. In the middle here are, is what we call transplant uh, donors. And so in uh, certain cases, again, with the appropriate consent, after all tissue that's relevant for um, uh, transplantation has been harvested, there are organs that are not transplanted. And those organs are, if appropriately consented, can be obtained. And in fact, they're obtained tissues. In the UK, there is a phenomenal resource called the CBTM, which is in Cambridge, UK. And in that case, they actually have access to a certain amount of the clinical record. Clinical records and doing analysis over the clinical records in a deep way usually requires not just a large case study, meaning a lot of cells, but also a large end study because there are so many variables and so many statistical confounders. I would say that would fall better within the premise of precision medicine studies that go in one way or a different way. Having said that, 
absolutely, the more de-identified clinical information that we can obtain appropriately, legally, and ethically when a sample is consented, the better. The extent to which this is possible varies between countries, varies between uh, locations. It's, it's, it's not that it's a challenge, it's just not as uniformly applicable as other aspects are. Yeah. I have two more questions. The green one in the back, and we'll end with Carl in the blue. So. Green one, yeah. Kevin Doherty, non-member. Um, if there was one biological experiment that you could add to this in the next decade, yeah. other than the RNA assays, what would it be? Oh, it would, just for ATLAS characterization? Yes, yes. It would definitively be to get to genomic scale on the spatial methods and to make them robust and applicable. Does that include chromosome confirmation capture? That is wonderful. It is extremely important from a cell biology point of view. That, I am not sure it is the most orthogonal type of data that would tell us the most distinct information. So epigenetic data, I actually wanted to say it also on the, when I was asked the epigenetic question earlier. What is very interesting to us about certain types of epigenetic data, and it depends on which type of epigenetic data, but for example on methylation, is that its timescales of information are different than the timescales of RNA and protein. RNA is a short time scale, seeing it's burstier, it changes more dynamically. It's great for things that are very dynamic, right? Um, proteins are slower, but still roughly in the same place. They tend to kind of report phenotypes in ways that, not for one specific protein versus its RNA, but on the profile of proteins versus the profile of RNAs, tend not to go very far from each other. However, certain types of epigenetic information, it could be true also for chromosome conformation, um, their time scales might be different. Methylation definitely has a different time scale. And as a result, it might give us a different lens into the same world, right? And so it's more powerful for us. But I think in general in our community, and definitely I personally, feel that the spatial organization is critical because it takes you out of cell intrinsic information that's internal to the cell, and it tells you something about that is extrinsic to the cell. And that's very, that becomes harder and harder to just figure out from cells alone. You can push it a certain amount, as I've showed you, but you usually need something auxiliary, like some partial spatial information. So going all spatial all the way, I think, would be very transformative. And there's a lot of effort in the community to go there. In many last, different ways. last question, Carl. Hi, Carl Merrill member of the society. I have to say this is a heroic project and, and I have a question but it may make it even beyond heroic and that is you didn't mention an entity that is an intimate part of us and that's the microbiome. Yes. And I wondered is there any plans to incorporate that in yeah. this or? So, so more through uh, I believe it's maybe even it's on the slide. Maybe. Yeah, um, more through, and it's not, uh, more through engagement with parallel initiatives that are doing it for the human already. So there is, there is a human microbiome project, that's the reason, and there is actually very nice and tight relationships because, for example, those colonoscopies that I've shown you, there is already, th those types of patients, not necessarily those 10 that I showed you, but those types of patients come from a partnership like that where there's also microbiome data collected for the same patients from stool samples. Um, there is similar work now done in tumors by labs that study microbiomes of tumors. There is similar work done by the skin folks where they also choose skin from areas because they're still not doing full human skin but just certain sub, some sub locations where we know that there would be both different skin and different microbiomes. So it is absolutely on everyone's mind, but it's more like sister projects than a single unified one, and I would say that's a justified thing. There are different considerations for each, and also putting bounds is a good thing. There's a lot within, so it's good to also say this we do with someone rather than we have to do alone. Yeah. Well, thank you. Before you thank go, you. Oh, before you go, I, get something. I, have, I have a little gift. So we have... Uh, the signed copy of the volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society and a framed signed copy of uh, the announcement of your talk. Thank you. Signed by all of the members of the General Committee on behalf of the membership. So thank you very much. And uh, 
Thank you. We have a few closing remarks before we end. Thank you. So before you go, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and uh, if you're not a member, I ask you to apply for membership, which is pretty easy to do. Probably easier than what I'm doing now. Come on, where are you? Okay. Yes, to apply for membership, you can go to our old and aging website, and there is a membership button here, which when you push it, will bring up the application for membership. So how many of you are not members? Oh, plenty of new members out there. So this is what you do. Pull up the membership application form, fill it out. There is no IQ test and no particular requirement other than an interest in science, a willingness to fill out the form, and a willingness to pay your dues, which are a nominal $37.50 for the half year and $75 for the full year. So you can't beat that. So please become a member and support PSW and continue our tradition to 150 years and beyond. Our next speaker will be Christopher Ralston. He is at uh, GWU and um, he's quite the linguist and he'll be speaking on cultural heritage and antiquities forgeries. Uh, I have to find myself. Chris is a brilliant linguist capable of rubbing a few feathers with the facts. He likely will be telling us about the trade in antiquities and in forgeries, including how we detect them and about ways in which antiquities frauds impact scholarship. And when they have religious significance, how they affect communities of believers. It's not always what you might expect. Religious communities sometimes know that a sacred object is not what it was originally believed to be, but nonetheless continue to revere it for what it symbolizes. Oh, I don't have the control there. The rest of the spring schedule as posted is as follows. Uh, we have Thomas Zerbuchin of NASA We'll be talking on what we learned from eclipses. And we'll be posting that information on the website soon. And following that, on March 23rd, we have Andrew Knoll of Harvard, who will be talking about life on Earth, the deep history, identifying and studying fossils that constitute the remains of the earliest living things. It's a subtle and challenging art, and I'm sure you'll find it interesting to learn about these distant relatives, and what they might tell us about life, not on Earth, but elsewhere. On April 6th, we have Jordi Puigswari of Cal Poly. He'll be speaking on CubeSats, of which he is one of the prime inventors. And I think many of you know that CubeSats are bringing about a revolution in satellite technology, lowering costs by orders of magnitude, which seems to be an age that we're living through, where costs for doing things like sequencing DNA or doing transcriptional analysis on whole single cells is falling in its cost and difficulty by orders of magnitude every few years. And this is true for satellite technology. And then finally, at this point on May 18th, we're hoping to have a special <coughs> Joseph Henry presentation on Cassini, which ended its long and very productive life this year. And we expect to have several of the prime scientists who put Cassini together, got it to Saturn, and plotted its very interesting trajectory around Saturn and all its moons and sent back wonderful pictures and lots of data and taught us a lot about the Saturnian system and our solar system. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Eric, OK, do I have a second? Any members in favor of adjourning to the social hour? All members opposed? We are adjourned to the social hour.